see how he integrated work, so that he was a big surprise to me. And also the world of Bohemia that you were talking about, of the 1950s, and then what people experienced in the road of the students. I mean, this is precisely the kind of world of Bohemia that, um, in some sense, allowed us different kinds of freedoms that uh, allowed us to explore things that we wouldn't have otherwise. Sarat is the next speaker. Sarat Das is uh, from the industrial city of Jamshedpur and then uh, he moved to Shatiniking for his bachelor's and master's degree in painting and then subsequently came to Delhi. And in fact he was my neighbor in Janakuri for many years. <laughs> and he lived in a little studio right behind before they became successful artists in Lithu and Sarat. So I know how their journey has progressed from one little Barsaki to a new studio space now. And uh, Samit also then subsequently went to the Cannaval School of Art uh, on the Charles Wallace Trust uh, Scholarship. And of late, he's become interested in the architecture of Shanti and I think this is something that he's going to speak about today. Over to you, Samit.
But anyhow, when you are in Delhi, then you just try to find out yourself, and that brought me to find out I'm talking about the space. And I don't have any individual title for my work. It's always a series of work. That's why I said it's the making of bibliography and in search of visual vocabulary because I'm interested from where the imagery developed at. Because it is not very easy to develop an imagery. As Atuta showed a lot of references, of course, I'm very happy with I'm interested about that even. The references always be required, and I think one should reveal that references from where the imagery is coming. Even if it is the internet, even if it is the archive, even if it is something else, I think one should believe that. And that is one movement, the Bengal School movement, what we call the art during nationalistic movement. I think those days they have tried their best to purify the tradition, folk, and many other things in trying to develop a new image. I don't know how much they were success. Of course, it continued till 47 or maybe 50 is maximum, but after that it is changed. And it has all disappeared at some point. But it was nothing to do with uh, Bengal. It, Bengal was just the epicenter. I think it was a nationwide movement. And many things still not explored yet, I think. Anyhow, we'll start with a little journey. I will start from my childhood. As Shivali said, I was born and brought up in Jamshedpur. So I will start from Jamshedpur again. And here, this is some inspiring words from Mangala Bush. Because I am not a typically conceptual artist, I must admit. I am a very, very visual person. I, I think visual should speak first. Once Ganesh Pine said, he, if I have to speak a lot about artwork, then I should be a writer. I should not be a visual artist. But anyway, I mean, it's a great compliment, but I am very much visual into that. I mean, I, as I said, my every image and research start from the visual. The Tagore architecture even start from looking at to more than 20,000 images at Rabindravan archive in Chandaniketa. It was no text, nothing was there actually. It was started from that imagery only. Once I started looking at the image, then I thought, oh my god, this is something I need to work, I need to uh, look at it carefully. So this is something from 1987 to 1996 from Jamshedpur to Art Institution, because one year I studied in Gadara Ramita College, and then I joined in Chandaniketa. And if you have visited Jamshedpur, Jamshedpur is a very beautiful city, small township developed by Tatars. It has a geometry, it has a nature, it has an organic quality, many things. And later on you will find all those elements in my work. Because when I thought what is the archive meaning, I thought these are all came from uh, my journey and it is all integrated part of my life. As a middle class Bengali, you know the art was not kind of existing element that form. It was a Rangoli typical decorative floral uh, decoration and also some god and goddesses images, you know. And that was a kind of a introduction of art at home. And I was very much inspired by that actually, though, what is uh, the strange thing. And alongside, I was copying some kind of a mechanical drawing, which is some steam engine drawing or something like that. And later on, again, we find the divinity is organic and not really the geometry all incorporated in my artwork. The left hand side photograph, it's a small uh, photograph, is a, a portion of the Jamshedpur city where I lived there for my 20 years, 19 years of my life. And that was the time I used to go to my art class and I thought this British Academy in watercolor is the most important and um, I mean inspirational thing. I had to learn it, so I was doing that kind of a art practice. And uh, I was very skilled to do that British academic watercolor skill. But at some point I thought, no, this is not the right thing. And in 88, I joined Calcutta Art College. I got introduced with that colonial architecture, modern architecture, the Victorian architecture, and many things. And the bottom photograph, that's my hostel, where the sky was not visible, only the ocean sky was visible. And I don't know, somehow I didn't like the education process of government art college, so I left that. But certain resonance and revolution, it is always remaining in my mind. I joined in Chandra in 1989, and it was just mind blowing. I can't explain what was it that time, at least. But I got inspired. I said, my friend, I need to study here. I don't know what, what makes me to be there. I was thinking about JJ, I was thinking about Delhi, but I settled in Chandigarh, and seven years I was there. And such an imagery, 
just started registering in my mind the elusive land of hidden landscape, the coil, the structure of idol making Durga, and the mud structure of the village. I mean, also they got some small mud structure which is made by children in the village. And during my studies, I was thinking about the space transit. What makes me interested? Because nothing was there. It's all politics. There's no decor. There's no philosopher in my time. Uh, it was just a regular university, perhaps, but still we got a little bit of freedom that time to continue the class for 15 20 days. Anytime you can go to studios. I mean, last time I think before you get this EDC structure, we got that freedom. And I was wondering about my space. What was my existence? Why, why I like this space very much? And my work was engaging with that system, actually. And it is a kind of a self-portrait thinking, sitting at my studio. And also, slowly, the architecture of Shandiniketan, which is involved and engaged with my art practice, some corner, some building portion, it is just started. And I thought certain buildings, certain plants, certain trees, which is creating the energy in Shandiniketan, it has nothing to do with perhaps human being, but the way the soil has been developed, the building, the trees, I think that has the energy. So some of this building is part of my art practice and I started painting them. And later on, of course, the specifically the architecture, because I was trying more deeper. Why the architecture, the simplicity, the split level, the open space, there are many elements. And also, slowly, I, I thought it is somehow related with the nature. I was not very sure because it was my student days. It was all very fragmented thoughts coming into my mind and it is involving my art practice. I was doing my dissertation and I was looking at the Ramadan archive. That was my first introduction to looking at the actual archive. So it is fragmented way all coming into my mind. And it has got a deep impression and I have to leave Shantanikitan in 1996. After my masters, I came to Delhi. And Delhi is a very different city. The Hindi language is even very different. It's a Haryani and Punjabi. And I'm that I want to brought up in Bihar now, it is Jharkhand, so Hindi is very different. So all those things were a big problem, but still I thought no, I have to continue my work. And how to sustain? How to sustain in the city? How to find out your own space? I forgot everything, what was Shantani Keta, what was the Tagore, what was this and that. And it, I find, of course, it is a small Bashati, and you should like to remember this is the photograph from the same Bashati where I live because I thought the shadow of this middle class Bashati, which is making the city actually, it has a very strong statement in the city. And middle class who serves the city actually. Even if you go to Gauntly, if you go to any shopping mall area, the middle class is always there. And I was finding my own space in the city because Shantini Ketan never questioned. This way, that who you are and how do you go further? It is a very difficult question which I learned being in the Delhi. And then one good thing about Delhi I find it questions every time who you are, how to create your own space, how to live in your city. So this is kind of a very beginning stage during 1997, 1999. I was just making small drawings so which is surrounded by me. And perhaps I was finding through those objects, my existence. And also, this is a, another version of the city, which I have I, I'm experiencing till today. Again. Because Delhi is not always very posh Kaluni, not uh, posh Manlus, but this is also Delhi and also a living installation, perhaps, for me. This is not a way, and I mean, proudly I expose it because this is something who serves the city. And this is a very, very important statement of the city. And somebody who offered the blanket, uh, the five rupees or ten rupees, and they leave and they sleep there. And I think this is a very, very important statement of the city. And I'm also finding, coming, started communicating with these people, okay, this is how they leave, and how I'm also living, because I'm also doing a job in a school, and at the same time, doing my own art practice, and at the same time, all those tegos, shanti the archive, they're all in my mind, but it is not coming out properly in a very small way it was exposing, but not very big way actually, because balancing act was very tough when you start a city like Delhi, coming from Jamshipur, studying in Shanti then 
in depth. So one has to first balance that act along with the art practice, keeping uh, your sensitivity, keeping, keeping uh, your romantic uh, approach, everything. It's a, it's a long struggle. So it, it took a long process to develop everything. And also I started looking at the grottest part of the city because always I feel human presence is there, fine, but without human presence, how to depict the presence, human presence in the city? So it's a multi-layered work I did. And this is, uh, of course, this last work, this work and this work I did in Chandigarh. There was a project called uh, 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 so How the City We, we Are Looking in uh, 2001, I think, yeah, 2001, to curated by Peter. And I worked with the uh, Karbuzir Archive, how he started the city from the barren land. And of course, I see Chandigarh kind of a three or four chopped uh, portion. One is the Chandra Garden, one is the capital complex. Other is the mess in the city. So altogether, it's a very different gesture, and that I thought I should try to explore through my work. And this is the installation I did in the Bombay. That's called Bombay to Mumbai. And the, all the photograph, this brick structure, this uh, rubble structure, wrapped up with the images from the Shwata Dibedi and uh, Rahul Mehrudra's book, The Bombay to Mumbai. And the other geometric structure developed by myself, photograph, sketch, and drawing, which is totally covered up with the structure. Okay, how the journey was happening, the Bombay to Mumbai, because I was interested for other cities sitting in Delhi, going to different cities and finding out whatever art projects come and looking at it, because uh, that was a kind of an interest. I thought I should look at it, how the Indian cities work, because Indian cities uh, have got a different history, it lives with the history. It doesn't have to go with the European cities because European city structure is completely different. And of course, I did a show called CE in 2007, and uh, it's called the conforming European standard. And this my question is that why we need to have a conforming European standard? Because India has its own civilization; the history is very long. And one of the artists, of course, are very much interested who intervention in the city and architecture is very very important. as Gordon Mata Clark. And this building is a Bevold Street uh, near the Pompidou Center in Paris. Uh, one can visit, I think, with the appointment and permission. Uh, Mata Clark, uh, who has really struggled in his entire life with the contractor and uh, builders and all sort of thing, because he never get much chance to show in a, in a proper gallery type of show. But uh, for me, Mata Clark was a very, very important artist. And he also did work in the Detroit. This is one of the cutouts and drawings and art pages from the artist's books uh, by Gordon Mata Clark. I'm very much uh, interested about Mata Clark's artist book event. And this is another uh, project I did uh, in Delhi that's called the sky. The fear of losing the wider sky from the city. If you go to the old Delhi, it's a series of photographs from old Delhi, and if you go to the old Delhi, you have to look the sky like this way, not this way. You can't see the wider sky actually. So that's the kind of illusion I brought back into the gallery. It's a large installation, and again, it has gone back to the city even because it came to the art gallery, gone back to the city because I didn't have money. So I sold the entire structure to the fabricator with the half price. <laughs> so it's going back to the city even. He said he's going to use it for some different urban structure or whatever of the city material because he's a fabricator. And of course, the city in history always in my mind, and that uh, kind of a work I did a lot with the photograph, photographic collage, and things like that, and how it is just opposing uh, with each other. And also, the belief you see, there is nothing in this little corner, it's just a red light, but people are watching, there is no God in it. This is small elements, but which is very important for me to observe the city. And that's a kind of a, perhaps the archive I developed through the city, city related material, Tagore related material. Of course, Delhi is a man made city, Jamshedpur is a man made township, and Chandaniketan is also man made space. And how my journey is transforming from one place to another. And I started documenting that, and I started creating work on that. And these works are all based on my photography. And last year you can see the photograph, the multi-layer city, and here you can see the multi-layer collage work. 
You see the photograph I'm inspired and I made a collage out of that. Because Indian cities I consider is a living installation. Because I think if you are doing installation, I think one need to really think which way and how the artistic intervention should be. Because uh, the city is very, very alive in that sense in many ways. And also the existence and security and insecurity in the city. The broken lock itself is a strong image of the insecurity and security in the city. And of course you can see the broken car in the Kosovo Minar, it says a lot itself. I don't need to say all that. And looking at this multi-layered cityscape, I started working on artist book. I mean, 2001, I never know the term artist book. I was stapling five, ten images together. Then the British artist Paul Caldwell says, oh, you're making artist book. I said, what is that? It's an artist book is something that the artist creates is a unique edition, sometimes it's a edi uh, uh, numbered edition. So uh, it has this uh, artistic approach. They, they, may have, uh, they may have a story, they may have a poem, they may have just an image there. I said, oh, without knowing it, and I started doing because I was not really happy with single piece of image. So I was started by putting together there. And right hand side, this is Bhut Putri Deshi by Avarindana Tagore. And later on, I find he made a wonderful artist book. Even Ravindranath made an artist book over there. And that's only one copy I have seen in the BNA archive, West Kensington uh, collection they have. This is also another artist book with a letter press, City GR9. It's uh, of course resonating some kind of a Jew memorial Berlin by Peter Eisenman. And this is some collage I really took to the historic monuments and I photographed them together and I find how exactly they are juxtaposing, how it is creating the multi layer approach in the city because the real architecture which is dominating the history. But my bad artwork, how it is dominating, or whether it is coming a good image. It's just an experimentation I have done with a series of photographs. And again, this is another series of work I did in the Bombay when I was doing the Kalatura, then I started uh, documenting the New Bengal Hotel in Crawford Market, which has changed a lot. I think it's nothing to do with Bengal. Uh, the owner is not even Bengali. When I was staying there, the owner was silly or something. But I think all the Bengali artists during their struggling days, they stayed in the hotel. It's a whole macrocosm of the city. And so my friend and curator, Gareth Peter Nagy, came to see how I'm living, whether I'm eating it or not. And he said, Swami, it's a wonderful space. Are you documenting? I said, already five film has exposed on that. And this is the show in the Neshamot we did, bringing back to the Libengal archive uh, into a Neshamot. And looking at all this thing, I was interested, again as I said, beginning of the lecture, what happened to India? And what was the history? What was the uh, kind of a text they have produced? And what was the exhibition happening here? I mean, I mean, I was interested about the 1910 to 1960s and 70s, because I was not much exposed to that material. So I went back to, again, there was a little bit of relax in my mind, so I thought, let's start with the research process and look back at the Tekor archive and bring all the school, so on. So I started looking back, and of course, that was the time I had a couple of talks in the old Radio, small exhibition on Tekor, and of course, later on, 2010, it was a big exhibition supported by Ashoti here in the Litkara, we had the Tekor architecture. But uh, this is the time I was looking at the whole archive and the whole idea of the movement because uh, seven years in Chandigarh and after that, it was always in my mind what was there and why these artists are so famous, what they have done, why they are no more now. I mean, nobody talks about it, hardly people speak about them. And what happened after 47 and 50, the whole idea of Bengali school immediately has totally washed out. And in context of that, even I did last year one big show in Paris. Uh, it's my research curation in the Villa Vassile Park. It's a part of my Pernodica Ferrucci. Uh, it's called the Punoche Paris, but we'll come back you know, later on that. So this photograph was stuck in my mind, who is dominating the strong Venetian architecture. That's the Ravindana Tagore. Of course, there are many Tagore. One, uh, the other day, one collector, famous personality, 
he was talking about me and talking about Tagore and he said, you know that Tagore has a uh, Western art collection. I said, Who's Tagore? which Tagore you are talking about? So he was totally confused. I said, it was Maharaja Tagore. It's nothing to do with Rabindranath and Abhinandranath who got this Western art collection. But the collection they had, which is now in the Kasturbai Nalabai collection in Ahmedabad. And the right hand side, the Shushimov, the translator and assistant of Tagore was in China. He has exposed Tagore as a mountain. Of course, it was the idea uh, within me that it must be like a uh, mountain. That's why he did of his university, he did this and that. Of course, there was another problem that he, he never thought that how Vishwati will come. That was a huge problem, I find. I mean, uh, in the 1950s, even Nehru uh, told to Ratimahu, Ratimahu, Tagore that you should try some different method like the way Ramakrishna mission is moving, but uh, you don't move under NGC. But uh, I don't know why Shanti Niketan went under NGC, now it is a very, very typical university, but uh, uh, you know, I think at a certain point, uh, they could never help anyone to grow perhaps. And I could see Shanti Niketan, everybody next to the world has grown like that. That's a very strange thing, despite of many things that he did actually. And I'm very much with Tagore's philosophy, his ideas, the idea of Darshan and many things, but there are also certain things which always question. But I'm much more interested about the number five Darshan house, which is no more. Because there was a politics, and of course that house got demolished, and this is one of the finest and very important photographs the Raval Bhagavan Shaman Ranath with the family member, they are sitting with the toys from Bengal. It is not just sitting, but they are also doing the research. And if you are familiar with the Bengal school painting, you can see from the research they have developed the artwork actually. Because that was also my interest from where the research goes and how the visual imagery comes out to the artistic practice. Because two different things, the curation, the curatorial text, the academic artistry, the artistic practice, I mean, I think it has got a huge distance and mixing three, four items together, it's a very tough work. I'm trying my best, but I don't think so I'll be successful in any way because it's very, very tough actually. So this image, I'm interested because uh, when I saw the Bengali school image, without knowing this image, I was wondering how they inspired, I mean, from where the images are coming. So the images. They are looking at the originals, they will join us. And this is also another important image which is in my mind I thought I should share with you. You have seen a lot this image, I think everybody has seen, but not perhaps these original drawing, penalty drawing. You can see the intensity of ink is showing that it's a drawing by Nandala Bush. And you can see why the number five Jorashako house and Bengali school got totally disappeared. Because three Tagore was sleeping actually. The Shawai Nunat, Gaurai Nunat, Papai Nunat. They are not careful about their whole ideas of Bengali school movement to take it further. But it was Anandu Kumarshan who was asking Nandurak Bosch to make an illustrated catalog of Tagore collection from where they got inspired to start the Bengali school movement, inspiration, the drawing, everything. The Mughal drawing especially was very collection. I have seen some few hundred drawings sitting at Kasturbai Nambai's uh, house. Uh, the Joseph Campbell, the editor of Andrew Seymour's book, he was the person, he saw the entire world actually, he explained uh, many, many things in one of his books. So you can see this is also a very important archival document to looking at the Bengal school movements. And also, 1920s, they did an exhibition, today we speak about site-specific installation, the installation, like uh, this, uh, this year in the Venezia Menang and the Palazzo Fortuny, they have an exhibition. I mean, the way Palazzo Fortuny is, and the curator invited artists to intervene onto that. But this is similar kind of thing, maybe not the same, but similar approach happened in the 1920s. It is in Kolkata. The photograph published in the Osikanguli's journal in the Society of Oriental Art, and you see the park mansion, they have that uh, household items along with artwork. So, if we are talking about and articulating contemporary art, I think we should bring out all these issues at some point and look whether it is really contemporary, really modern, or not. This is also.
also engineer of George Shaka Tekun House during the Shalashi movement. They derived from Japanese design, uh, it's a totally Japanese influence because uh, Tekun thought at some point the idea of East is much more stronger than West. So uh, it is very much Japanese, but again, uh, a bit difficult and critical after visiting Japan. And I have uh, really visited the whole <coughs> Tagore street in Japan, Tagore's train in Japan, actually. So anyway, that is a different story, but uh, this is something C-shaped dining table they have uh, created. And C-shaped means they can interact with each other. That is the reason they made a C-shape, actually. Because you know the Joroshoko house have got a large uh, number of uh, people. Uh, this is the, <coughs> the left-hand side inside of Joshua House and total internal reflection. And next to it is Gaurangonath. And many historians, they say Gaurangonath is a curious and all sort of thing. But once you look at Joshua Thakurbari's photograph, Joshua Thakurbari, you might think that Gaurangonath is still alive there. His stories, his writing, his painting. So I think immediately referring to the West, one should look at the back at home. And also, I was wondering, in Shantanika, the landscape, the Russian plan, which was very much attractive those days when it was still exist in my student days, I was wondering who the artist was inspired from those landscapes. It was many, including Bela Bihari Mohaji. It is a short story, so I'm keeping it very brief. In case if you're interested, you can go to my website, it's just endless. And also, the architecture I was interested in, and I find this architecture is kind of inspired from the big home uh, landscape, the LOC land, the speed level. The two reasons they have a speed level. One is that Kauai, the LOC land. The second is the money constraint. Because many houses, almost all the houses, took five to eight years to complete. It was no money. And this one is my work inspired from the big home LOC land and the urban scape. But this is one of the early examples of the architecture in Shandani, even the glasses under trees. And look at this image. This is documented by Jemo Borgir and Ara Danielu. I think if somebody has not seen the Shandani Kirtan by Danielu and Borgir, Shandani Kirtan is not complete. I think this photograph taken by Danielu and uh, Borgir, I mean, not only the photograph taken by Borgir, but they say it's a uh, Asian army to be that. Because, uh, that's what Jack Rudolph said in from the Alabama uh, Youth Center. And look at this event, this is very important in the Havel Hall, which is totally spoiled today, and which is no more, you can't feel all this thing. And you see how the classes are going on. Simultaneously, the discussion, simultaneously the exhibition. What a concept of cutting a space. Well, these are all questioning myself, these are questioning myself during my art practice. Then, what is modern? What is postmodern? What is how long we should do? And what we had actually. See, this is a small architecture. It's called Choito. It's from the Choito, uh, from the Bengal Heart. Whenever they have the best small artwork, they want to exhibit here in the Ashram, in Shantanikita. What a site they have developed to exhibit artwork. Those days, imagine it was happening in 1920s, 1930s, because it didn't continue for a very long time, it is stayed for a very short period. But what a concept they have to that. And also, the private and public space, the left hand side, the bed of design by Brother Nanam Tagore, uh, is family of the Maharaja Tagore family, and the right hand side is a low height stage in Srinigeta. Regularly, day to day, they have a performance and program there. How they derive the private and public space? And of course, the large scale floral decoration of the food grades. It is also, I think, uh, kind of a question of the community art those days. And this is very interesting. I think many of you have visited Shantanika and you have seen these uh, frescoes in the old library veranda. But many of you may not know that the Lord used to write poetry, four line poetry, each day for Nala before he started his painting. It's an amazing idea. I think those days it could be the idea of the whole curatorial note, perhaps. Before he starts, he's giving the notes. And later on, these poems 
come on to read and publish as a dog, dogs. And look how it has happened. And also, you know, this sculpture, Shijata, it's also questioned the public sculpture, you know, maybe it's about Ramlinger, and of course, Ramlinger was one of the major figures in Shatrikita, and uh, I think because of Rabindranath, uh, the person sustained them, otherwise, maybe it would be difficult for him to sustain them. And this is a kind of a interior, is a bed designed by Srinivasa. It's a multi-folded bed. It's got a design table, bed side table, uh, storage box, many things together. It is still there. It is very much Japanese and mixed with the powerhouse perhaps. But it has its own spirit, I must say. If you look at it with the scale, volume and thickness, it has its own spirit. And Rabindranath was very specific about many things. As I said, he was a great professional person. The later said, the Shuren, these days I don't need, it's one of his chief architects, Shuren He said, these days I don't need the bigger tabletop. So can you make a small tabletop for me? And also some mosquito stands this and that. That's the Bengali later, he has explained to Shuren. He was a so specific person talking about the tabletop. And next is a Japanese uh, small table. He must have inspired from that, I, I'm not very sure. But I'm just putting it together because he stayed in that when there was a Hala's house in some King Garden. And look at his painting and its architecture. The Durus of Tagore and architecture in Shantikita. And it's resonating each other, actually, we can't deny. And also, he was very much specific about space, so he never liked the large house through there. Perhaps he found his existence in the second floor. So only in the second floor you can see the human existence because he wrote a letter why he liked the space. And he also wrote a letter, another letter, why he did not like the entire house room. So this is one of his favorite place, the northern house room. He explained that to Rani Mahalavish why he liked it. And I think this photograph says that Tagore was true sense architect and also the big think of the way it has been set up. I don't know who did it, consciously, unconsciously. I don't have any idea. I, I could not find the photographer's name even. But I think it itself says a lot. And most casual photograph of Tagore, because I'm having a huge number of Tagore's portraits, more than 300 published and unpublished, from never years of old, every time he's very, very conscious in front of the camera. I think this was. Uh, very rarely he is not that conscious. Now also one or two photographs taken by Rigo Gordier, which is not that conscious. Then I thought, let's bring out to my art practice, because that's a kind of a hardcore archive. I did my research, the book has come out, and uh, also the other materials published by different journals and all. I thought, how to bring out that material into a, the art form, because end of the day, I'm a visual artist. I have to make my art, because without that I can't be. And I can't stay actually. I can't see quite in that sense. So, this is the archive based work I did. And of course, it was part of our exhibition. And it said the title was In Search of Thousand Music. And here, it's a Tagore portrait by Boris Georgiev, some of the historical architecture's fragments, and this uh, Tagore poem embossed where he was talking about space. Because he has a series of poems which is talking about space and also he got into his own conflict about his own existence. That he did deliberately or without deliberately, I don't know. So some of his work from that series. And this is the then under construction. And uh, this is uh, Tagore's uh, painting and Tagore is sitting carefully watching it. If you look at some of the photographs, the way Tagore looked at his painting, he was not that casual. And many people say Tagore has started painting in his better age, but it's not true. I have a huge, long evidence that Tagore was doing all the time his drawing and painting. Even recently I did it, uh, not recently, two, three years back, it was a notebook came to me. Uh, that there was a notebook he was, he was uh, keeping his year age 28 to 32, and a lot of drawings are there. It's all very strong, very strong drawing. So it's not true sometimes uh, to say, uh, well, uh, Tagore started it uh, much later, but he was doing all the, all the time in his life. 
So some of these archival responses you can see, and there's a whole series I made, it's called In Search of Fossil Music. And I was also interested from where these architectural shape, this design formation, this indigenous temple. You see, this is the um, Basil little temple, Basil temple from Bengal. That's the uh, tea ceremony of Rome in Shantanikitan. And also, this is another book responded to the archival photograph, which is uh, the East Tower and Western Tower. And you see the Rokakudo designed by Okakura, that's the tea ceremony of Rome, and responding to both of these it is my work. Because at the end of the day, always I respond to the archive and I try to make my own artwork. And you can see here how Shabari facades look even. And from where they might have, I mean, interested to look at it, or they might have taken some resonance and some influence, I don't know, but this is where I can see it through my research. This is from the same series. And these two projects ended up with a big show, one is supported by Lalit Kala and Ashoji here, that's in Lalit Kala 2010, and uh, in Nature Mode Gallery. Nature Mode Gallery was responding to, responding to the archival archive, and the Lalit Kala was whole archival show. And working on this figure, I was wondering how come these foreigners come to the Tegura house and talking about art, and these Anand Kumar Shami, uh, there's a sister of New York, and Sita Mokakura, yeah. And I find the person behind was the Shami Vivekan who got a first hand experience of Indian art as a Korean blood. And of course, he was the person who looked at Charles Freer's collection. Today it's a Sakura uh, Freer gallery. And uh, Vivekan wrote many things on art and all that is out there. And he has instructed to Pirunath Shibho how to paint in and many things. And that exhibition even traveled to Victoria and Amori of Kolkata. Yeah, this is the Swami Vivekan also. So, you know, my research and my art practice goes simultaneously. So it takes two, three years to build up a body of work based on archive and the whole archival research, it goes as an archival show. So back in 2014, I did a huge show in the Academy Academy that's called Resonance of Swami Vivekan and Art of Nandana Bodh because I was wondering, Vivekan was never an artist. So how can Vivekan transmitted the idea and who was the artist who was really inspired and who did the uh, formation of art through so Vivekan's philosophy? So that's one of books I find. You can uh, see this exhibition in my website, the whole visuals are there. And at the same time, I was interested about all this digging up process because it is in my life the excavation and archaeology, the digging up the archive, is the digging up many things. It's always there, it is started. So in actual artwork also I started digging up the things. I mean using power tools, tearing up the paper, I mean burning up, things like that. So there's a kind of a work I was doing that time. I mean it's 2013 and 14. And then of course the excavation and archaeology, it is very much integrated with my art practice as I mentioned in the beginning that Lavar Shah was uh, mine. And archaeology is something which dissolves because he was taking something, he was standing on a civilization, but underneath of your ground, there were many things, the many years which is like. So that's kind of amazing idea of archives and archaeology and think. So that's how my inspiration of course looking at uh, Okakura's memorial. I was very much interested to what it was and the way he wanted his memorial. It was amazing. And also I'm interested about the reprographic changes in archive. Look at this photograph, this is from the John Marshall book I have taken from a high resolution lens and it is giving a very, very different feeling. And once you go through different books of these Harappan images, it will give you very different images. And same with Ajanta. I have two, three rare version of Ajanta book on Ajanta. It gives complete different images. And currently we have a has taken photograph that I think those old books are amazing in that sense. And this is some of the series, it's called Bibliography in Progress, from that archaeology. So I'm running quickly now, I'm running out of time perhaps, so this is response to the whole idea of archaeological 
excavation. As I mentioned that by show, I've been digging up many things. I was interested in what happened to Bengali school, why it is no more discussable matters and all, what happened to the artists who went to the Paris and how they worked and all. So of course I have chosen many artists uh, which was existing, uh, the work was existing in Paris because I can't carry any work from India. It was a uh, huge budget thing and of course the uh, insurance and also we have to take work from the Paris and it was a big show happening in the Belarus here as part of my pedagogy pathology. It's called Ponash and Ponash Shikari is a book written by famous Vedal Majandar and he was, the whole book is about the discourse of Indian philosophy and philosophy of the France or Paris. You know, the culture of the Paris, culture of the Kolkata, it's all together, it was amazing books. So I thought this would be the right title for the show, it's called Ponash Shikari. And of course, the journey goes on and I found this is one of my favorite ways to look at it, the steps in the Benares and the boat making, because uh, once they will say that uh, my Jopa, uh, in Bengali, he said, Jopa, which is how Japanese is to go for boat and motto, and Japanese is to be for as it. Ye Jopa, ye very couple, you have a whole chance, it's kind of like a real loser town, a real person town. So it's a very different idea of the body and journey, I believe, to the boat. And of course, the first line, as I said, the Martin Deho Mati Habe Kamera Ahamka Tuni Bhavari Yaiqa. Shahid Aapke Vekti Vehi Bapu Jayegi, but Ahamka Karni Ki Kuri Zarurat Nehi. That's my whole idea of the archives and archives outside. Thank you very much. I'm sure there's time for a few questions. Akhil, Manisha. Yeah, So let me then just go back to uh, some of the things that I uh, wanted to raise. Uh, uh, with you, Atul, you know, uh, so this whole issue of uh, the GG School of Arts, very strong grounding in academic practice. And the fact that, uh, you know, we quite often lament that this is a curriculum that's been there for years now and hasn't changed. But in some sense, the way you actually pushed it I thought was absolutely fascinating because that's what your journey has been after graduating from the JG School of Art is that you've taken the same genres but have you know this very self-reflexive critical practice. Uh, and the other thing that fascinated me was that uh, you know art history is not really taught in the JG School of Art as far as I can recall. And this fascination for art historical references in your work. So just a couple of things that I thought were fascinating about your talk. Uh, could you just elaborate a bit? <coughs> well, I guess I say you know, in my presentation that the, uh, we always felt that uh, uh, you know, it was difficult to, uh, I mean, the, you know, the history lessons or the classes were quite dull. We were not inspired. We were kind of, oh, aesthetics was there, but even there it was, uh, not really engaging, we felt, you know, at that time. So, I mean, but there was one subject you have to follow. But when you study the artist, and from there when it comes, then you get engaged into the whole thing. But I was never in, but um, even till today, I'm not, uh, like if you, uh, if I have to you detail about historical details, something there, I'm not perfect. But it's just, uh, you know, uh, you love something so much that it becomes part of your, you know, uh, the process and uh, you imbibe it, you kind of, uh, you think about it and then um, since things were not available, it was a craving. 
if things are available, then I'm sick. Today, you know, with the internet, I can see anything. You know, what's happening in New York today, or in Paris, or interviews on YouTube, you know, the artists and all that thing. So it's so much. And what happens if, if it's a problem with the internet and this kind of a too much information that, um, like, I want to check Jasper Jones, so if people suggest Russian work and Bob you know, that other, others. And then I get, because of my weakness, I get tempted to check others as well. Then it is kind of dilute, you know. And so during that time, it was not there. So it was literally, I, I would stroll on the uh, streets of uh, Fountain, and there used to be art studio magazines to come, some books would come. And one book I will get, which will give me a few ideas about Francis Bacon or Jan Pomitu or something. And then you kind of know, you imagine you try to be, I was not, I'm still not good in the language, but you know, kind of call a friend who is good with the language, explaining these words and all these things. So there was an uh, immense urge from within. And that's how this whole thing kind of you know, become part of it. And then I felt that, well, uh, um, I have said this earlier also that, it has to take all this thing for whom? For me. Mm. It made it for me. It's all mine. See, belonging is one thing, and possession, or kind of, you know, um, owning, there's a difference. It belongs to me. And I, I always felt that way. So that's something, you know, interesting that, you know, that, so, uh, so what hesitation? I have to like, you know, use these images and things like Sometimes people tell me that oh, there are so many references and quotations of other people's work. What if someone doesn't know those works? I said, what should I do? It's not my problem. I know it. Ganga was my mother and she saw. She said, well, I know the myth of Ganga. Bhagirat, Nandi, Bhagavati, and all that. But what is this? I said, that's Master Dusha. And, you know, so then, uh, but she isn't a good show. But when I exhibit this work abroad, when I show this image abroad, they know the show, but they don't know the myth of Ganga. I know both. So I enjoy it. So I, there's a puzzle. And I just love that when the viewer is, you know, desperate and gets irritated. That's a very good thing. Because then it remains for a longer time with the work of art. If you get everything which is given to you, so then there is no fun, but you know, like it, it's bothering you, you keep on thinking about it. So probably that's how I, I think. One thing I would say, just, you know, when I did this, uh, uh, another work, similar with using Marshall Duchamp's uh, profile, my tongue in my cheek, in one of the large work works, it was called Ascent, and there was a little bull like a manta. There's a reason for all that, there's a story about it. So when we were at the Sakshi at the opening in Lower Paril then, and then when I was opening, and uh, they were very furious. I said, what the hell? I mean, you know, what do you have to do with the song? It all happened during after the First World War. Cubism was in its full bloom. And we forget these things, and with Picardia and others, there is a reason to that. I mean, in, you know, you are here and you, know, you have nothing to do with that particular period or anything. And still you talk about these things in your painting. I said, hey, what, what should I do? This man, Marshal Dushan, every morning he comes to Ghatko and bothers me. <laughs> so Ghatko is the suburb where I live. You know, so then he, he nodded, but then next day he called me. He said, I thought about it. I think you are allowed to talk about Dushan. <laughs> Uh, you know, but I was actually also fascinated by this idea of artistry being received through reproductions because you talked about how, you know, you first saw paintings as reproductions before you actually saw the originals and then how the originals actually fascinated you. But someone said something very interesting to me which is about the deteriorating image because, you know, you've spoken about how the reproductions that you saw of archaeological sites or the Ajanta paintings that you saw in books were images that had deteriorated due to pixelation through the reproduction process, etc. And there's this very interesting essay, I think, of Hito Sir, where he talks about in praise of the poor image, because that's actually how we receive images today, that they're very poorly, you know, they're of low resolution, they're not of high quality, but they reduce a different kind of an aesthetics. 
So I was just wondering whether you were really fascinated by that aspect in what you were doing, because I do see you as, that you use the pixel quite often and a kind of a deteriorated image as a part of your language. Yes, I do fascinate it actually. You see, the one way I fascinate it to make my own art out of that, I mean, how it is deteriorating, how it is changing. At the same time, the content-wise, even the reactionary mind, every art book, if you see from the 1910, because I am having many of Burlington, many of studios, Robashi and whatnot, everything I have, and I find the imagery is something which speaks a lot. That is why I have started my own website called Art and Visual Archives. And once these archives, you see different level of images, I mean, changing, I should not say the word deterioration or something, but changing the whole reprographic system. And that creates a very different notion to talk about history, the historical analysis even, the person who did the analysis in the 1940s, looking at that image, not even in the original perhaps, but today, he or she might have a different notion, different perspective. Because everything, even if you look at the original, you, you are getting a space between the original and you. So you have a space between that reprographic image, the book or whatever, the poster, and you, you have a space. So always there is a gap. And you, one need to struggle within that. As a visual interpreter, I have that story. Whenever I do the research or I make art. Of course, it is there, and I'm fascinated about that, and I'm interested about old books, even old and new, both actually. I mean, I have a huge documentation of Bauhaus School in the Sensei to Work Library, and uh, without looking at it, I would not understand what was Bauhaus actually. What are the details? Because even the variety of publications, that is also important, variety of publications which is very important and the way it has published in 1986 when I came to Delhi in IIC, Upen Kakar said, I'm interested to listen from artists what they say. I'm really interested what the art book says actually or what artists say. And one of the many books, they have artist quotation, Indian and Western both actually. So I'm interested about that area because of which I call put unquote primary source, nothing is primary because Everything comes through legend, oak, many things, many layers are there. It's nothing is foolproof in that sense, but yeah, and you're right. I mean, I'm fascinated both of them actually. Yeah. And Manisha, I have one question for you, which, um, you know, you're one of the few artists who's actually been honest enough to say that artists love to party. I mean, I don't think anyone, you know, uh, says that upfront and honestly, but uh, I found that fascinating as an idea because uh, in some sense, the space of bohemia that uh, artists create for themselves, that space for absolute freedom, is uh, something that's central to the idea of a kind of a modernist uh, discourse of art. And I know even in the Koch book, when the you know the first essay opens, it says so. You know, everybody would go to Koch and you know everybody would party and sing. And in some sense, I was just you know wondering whether you would like to talk a little bit about that because. Baroda, for instance, uh, the MS University Baroda, or even earlier the Delhi Shilpi Chakra, you know, these were spaces that allowed artists to kind of break free from the restraints of a middle class life they might have otherwise been a part of, and what that allowed you to do. Um, I think when I, when I say party, um, it is a space I'm talking about where ideas were pouring out and there were conversations happening. And I think there was, there was a certain, certain sense of exchange, honesty, and truly an attempt to grow with each other. And I think there was a kind of very passionate holding on to certain kind of ideas. I'm talking of a different time. I think it's a, it's, it's a time where artists were living a life with certain ideas, quote unquote, and I think that was a measure. Uh, I'm not sure whether that is the same now. Um, I'm, I'm failing to find places where one can speak honestly and openly speak one's mind out. I think there's a kind of consciousness which we all now start to live with. And I think that's not a space which allows ideas to be exchanged. That's why, I don't know why I feel much freer when I'm traveling, much freer when I'm away from the familiar surroundings. 
So it's a question I want to put to everybody. Why can't we have that kind of comfort and trust in articulating one's mind? And it, it's something which doesn't happen easily. It does, it's not something which can, one can plan and do it. We tried many times at coach to have one-on-one, -on -one, to have artist discussions. and It doesn't happen. Perhaps in a party it can happen. <laughs> where the barriers are falling down. Where the, where the, where the, so I'm, 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 I'm not using the word party in a flippant manner at all. It's a very committed kind of space where certain kind of trust and conversations can happen. Yeah. And I've seen that happen. A grown-up. I want to ask from Manish Bhai. So I just love your work, especially the one with leaf and bomb. And, uh, I just love that particularly. So uh, I, I, I just wanted to make a comment first that I think you are uh, pushing the boundaries of drawing in some sense in all of your work. I think you are very much, maybe maybe you are connected to drawings a lot. I would just love to uh, know about oh, whether you is still uh, like first your inspiration becomes drawing and then how, how you perceive a drawing on uh, your entire like um, process. Um, I rushed a bit towards the end of my presentation so I, I think I lost the flow of thoughts. My work is entirely about drawing one way or the other. Whether it's uh, really like drawing on paper or drawing with paint or drawing with the sculptural pieces are like three-dimensional drawing. Everything is about a line. Uh, whether it creates a journey from one point to another or like the way Clay, Paul Clay talks about. Or it's a line which is creating shapes. Or it's a line which is a train, train of thought which I'm following. Or it's a line of experience which I'm following, imbibing and trying to distill the essence of it in while making the work. So I'm very, very uh, uh, definite about the fact that the work starts from drawing to begin with. As an idea or as physically an act of putting a line on paper. So I have uh, two questions and one for the Museums. I have been very interested in the way you invoke museums, showcases, and vitrines in your work. And I didn't know what you had done in Hogarji Art, which I was seeing in the sites for the first time. Your 7,000 museum, which was very funny and very pointed and very interesting for me. So I'd love to hear you talk about what museum as a recurrent motif and as a recurrent visual mode means in your work? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, as I say that, you know, uh, um, we, in India, we don't have museums. The museums which we have, let's say, the uh, uh, National Museum or Prince of the Museum or Indian Museum in Canada, they are museums for the ancient, uh, uh, you know, art, mainly. And then, you know, I saw the contemporary artisans and there's an MGM, there's a branch in um, Bombay and also they do something in Bangalore as well. But uh, otherwise, one of the private museums, so they, we don't have that. And you know, what I noticed that gradually when I started traveling, I'm not talking about, of course, um, places like Burma or Cambodia, I'm talking about the West, Europe and America. They are rich country and they have a huge, uh, uh, you know, um, sort of uh, budget or the programs or you know, that there are museums for long period like Louvre or Metropolitan and uh, uh, others, you know, um, Yomar Gai and Berlin and all that. And the uh, great collection. So what, when I started seeing those museums visiting in course of time, I felt that they are so beautiful. Such a beautifully displayed work, you know, and there are so many programs every time with some new shows are happening, you know, there are guides and audio guides or whatever guides and there are you know, even the young children, you know, they are kind of a, there's part of a and they are kind of explaining all this thing happening and there is, I notice the people also have a lot of joy. Now, of course, our problems are different, you know, um, uh, people come to uh, Prince of Wales Museum in Bombay or Bhagavadji also and uh, how does they come because mainly they go to see the zoo mm -hmm. the next show and 
passing by sometimes they enter into the museum. Or uh, people come in a bus load in the uh, inside of the museum and they have a quick crowd and go. But um, so that means you know, they, people know that one should be going to a museum. That one thing is sure. There is something which is, you know, uh, I like in, um, in Bengal, it's called what Jadubhai. Jadubhai, you know, so that's a nice word for the uh, museum. But, um, <clears throat> so they don't go, but when they come out, then they have to catch a train, they have to go, you know, to Thane or Goli or somewhere, and then say, too much of basic issues. So, I agree. But still, I think, uh, but I think it, it, yeah. it, it uh, keeps occurring as a motif in your work. Yeah, so, so, uh, so when I thought that, well, it's for whom? Users of, uh, users of the people, essentially. And then I kind of thought about, um, it would be there for a long time, that what if uh, uh, the, and kind of, uh, 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 you know, very avant-garde kind of architecture of the museum which I saw, I saw a big show in Berlin about the 21st century museums uh, and a very unusual shape, like Bilbao, say for example, in, in uh, uh, Bilbao Guggenheim, by Gary, Gary, Frank Gary. So I said, oh, imagine, um, and I was, I was angry and I was sympathetic, both, you know, uh, feeling together about the viewer and about, you know, nothing is happening and no uh, museums, etc. But imagine you have a museum in Zumbi, Berlin, or if you are uh, in a museum in Rachi, and everywhere, every small town, every city has something, you know, with her. But if this is the kind of, you know, very omaga, so it's just a very uh, strange, those kind of museums will look awkward because outside Bhavadaji, if you come out, there is baby sits, a you know, old woman with a big scale where you can, you know, pay two rupees or something and, you know, you can get your weight done. How much she must be earning? So the, the reality within the museum is one thing and outside the, and I'm mentioning both reality, on the street as well as what's happening in the museum. So then I kind of started uh, creating uh, images, you know, taking something from Gary or someone else and then adding, shuttle around it or uh, do something and, um, it, yeah, it's, uh, Kind of a uh, lot bit tongue and cheek and some you know uh, mockery and some fun and some pain and agony. It's all mixed thing which I in that was strip show which I did because ultimately it's all about art and you know uh, a person who sees art yeah. and feels something happens to us when they are looking at art. If anyone else can ask, you know, all of you are very accomplished. In the field for a long time, but it was very interesting how all of you go your art school days. I know that's another institution that we think of as being really the gold drums where you learn something in spite of your art education. Okay. So I was just wondering if you'd like to reflect a little bit on the state of art education, art school, what is your. It's pathetic. Yeah. <laughs> it's pathetic. If you go to the school of art, and I said it, the way it was, it's, it's, it's still the same. They never come to see our exhibitions. I go and tell them, you know, grab, teacher Sogarman is in the city, call him. And you know, we should invite him, you know, when you get opportunity, they never do anything. They never even take students to your know, teachers are like a government clerk, you know, office clerk. They come at uh, 9.40 and uh, 8.30 and 3.30 they leave. They are not practicing artists themselves. So I think what, what they will teach students. Students are like a lump of clay, you know, you mold them, teacher mold them. But uh, our teachers, you know, and, and, and what is sad that I'm talking about, I passed out in 82 and I was fellow, so I was teaching there for one year and then I didn't continue my teaching. But so during that time, what was the situation? It's still the same. And you wonder that, you know, I mean, why? I mean, there's an art school in Delhi also. Why are they not here? And then I, I, I asked Asunji, you know, we do, we do in my, there's an email go, there's an official you know, invitation, everything. So I think, you know, a bit, um, uh, it's not a good feeling, you know, to feel that. Some teachers, one or two, or some little group of students, so what we, we, we learn on our own, you know. We would kind of go to artists and you know, ask them. So few, three, four friends. And Shavit, your talk was all about the very revered institution for which you have 
unbounded affection and respect, but is that the institution of old? Or how, how would you feel about something in different today? No, I think it's both the way. You see, one has to do Shantanik in a practical way. You see, uh, till 1950s, it was completely different institution before it became a uh, university. And after 2010, I believe, is we can totally under EGC structure like four years course, semester, uh, this is that, something like it, you know. So, and the time I have studied, Still, it was under UGC, but we got a lot of flexibility. As Jane said, that Ajati. Ajati was very much <laughs> because we used to have three weeks classes for life study, three weeks for this study, that study. We can be any teacher any time, we can go to any department, all those freedoms are there. Now it is a bit restricted actually. There is a timing, 10 to 5, the semester is a pressure. You know, like as Manisha said, the Adda, that one of the Adda, the education through Adda, it was all there actually. So, in that way, to cut from the long story, I must say I am really grateful to Dr. But one has to be very practical and analytical. One should not go blind to the institution like Shantanikita. You can just go in a very different direction actually. Like it took me many years to digest many things. Like as I mentioned, the Shantanikita never taught me to question who I am. He's always with the scholars and famous personalities and bearded persons. And you feel like you are going like little girl You don't question yourself. That's a huge disaster. And that learned me this city, this day. I'm really grateful to Delhi. Nobody loves Delhi, but I love Delhi. <laughs> <laughs> no, because this is a city which is, kind of, which is kind of creating the entire struggle to leave yourself. Yeah. You're talking about the space, and that's what my space is. We're uh, uh, exploring actually to my heart. And, and small cities doesn't have this question, that, that's also another problem. And I acquired this actually. If I go to Switzerland, Zurich or some places, it's all the same, the strain is same, it's good to see the museum, so nobody can see on the road, it's just quiet. But here, it's just energy flowing everywhere, you know. I mean, maybe somebody doesn't need it, but I need it. I think Baruda did well. Um, I, my seven years over there prepared me quite well and when I was, uh, when I went to Royal College of Art, my art history was not bad except for those 30 years in contemporary art which I needed to catch up on. Um, Baruda has some amazing teachers even now. I go there as an examiner and people like Vasudev Akitam is, um, is an unsung hero at the moment. I think he's been an amazing teacher and the teachers in painting department in Baroda almost cater to the entire faculty there. There is not much teaching in artistry as we all know that's collapsed. Sculpture also didn't have that. The library has stopped kind of acquiring new books but painting department has a separate library and these five, six individuals have managed to do that. So what I think is not institute, it's the individuals which make the education system. Why can't we have a fry university like Germany has? We don't need a structure, you need a room to have a conversation. That's what, I want, I, that, that's what I'm talking about. It's the conversation, it's the exchange of ideas. You don't need walls to do that, you need a hub, you need a space where a free conversation is possible. Age or uh, you know, with no bars. And I think it's with, we are all makers, we are all practicing artists, why can't we share our ideas and share our practice, that would be enough, that would be enough to pass on. So, I mean, we can stop gaining institutes, we can't institutes ourselves. We don't have to wait for anybody.
secretary in the government. And I used to pretend that I am attending a parliamentary committee meeting. If somebody rings up. And I disappear for two hours to attend that Kuryata. Nobody from Kathak came ever come. So this is the whole situation. It's not merely institutions of course have been destroyed by government. They are destroyed by the academics and they are destroyed by the student. Each one plays the role of destruction. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you all for still watching this meeting. Tomorrow at 5 o'clock, come a little early so that you will have tea. Otherwise, we know we have hit 8.30 in the rather late in a rainy traffic.